Let us be in an attitude of prayer together. Eternal God, thank you for the gift of music, a beautiful way in which to worship you and to sense your presence and spirit with us. Oh Lord, I thank you for all those in this church who share their gifts. It is a gift. And now, Lord, you have given me the amazing privilege and responsibility of preaching your word to these my friends and your servants. Lord, a task I certainly need your strength in order to do. So, Lord, speak to me and through me in such a way that all of us do receive a word from you today that will make a difference to our lives. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm going to tell you something very peculiar about me. I love to watch infomercials. Anybody there? Yeah, I told you I was peculiar. I don't know. There's something about infomercials. There's something about the, pers the persuasive nature of them, the way they can talk and lure you in to think that you cannot live without a gadget that will crush up onions and little pieces in a minute. You cannot live without a particular golf club that will make you play like Jack Nicholas whenever you play golf. You cannot live without that particular exercise equipment that will make you as muscular as Arnold Schwarzenegger every time you use it. And it can be yours for five easy payments. I once had a friend who was a sucker for all this stuff. You went into his house and he had all these gadgets in his house that he bought. But the interesting thing was he never really used them for the purpose in which they were supposed to be used. For example, his treadmill that he was supposed to walk on or run on, he didn't do that. He used it to hang his clothes. Anybody out there? He also bought this driver, and he only used it to play golf, I think, once. The rest of the time, he used it to squash bugs. A $300 bug killer, that seems a bit excessive, but what the heck do I know? And there was a time, some years ago, I was really staying up late. It was late at night, and I came across an infomercial where they were selling a set of secret recordings entitled, get this, Your Wish is Your Command. And the man who was selling his book and his, his recordings was very persuasive. He said that we can get whatever we want in life. Isn't that great? All we have to do is program our brain to the right frequency in the universe, and the universe will move heaven and earth to give us what we want. Doesn't that sound really good? That's to me. Of course, he didn't tell us how to do it. We had to purchase his book and his recordings. But, you know, can you put a price tag on getting what you want? For five easy payments, it could be yours. I don't know. I thought at the time of buying it. Because, you know, sometimes I'm not doing it right. I mean, the last round of golf I played, I didn't play very well. Maybe my brain is not tuned into the universe. But, you know, what's interesting as some call this wish fulfillment, the law of attraction, others call it. And it's based upon the belief that if you train your brain to think the right thoughts, the, the universe will be attracted to it and then give you whatever you're thinking about. It's an enticing idea, but not a new one. Some people in the church have used it, but they use other language for it. Instead of the word universe, they say the word God. It's called the prosperity gospel, baby. Oh, yeah, God wants to give you your every desire, your every wish. I saw a guy, a guy on TV selling all this stuff. He apparently had packages, little packages of water from the River Jordan. I don't know if it was tap water or from the River Jordan, but he had blessed it. And it had the power to give us whatever we want. All we had to do was donate to his church. And then I saw another preacher. Oh, you see him all the time when you turn on the television. You say, God wants to bless you. All you have to do is name it and claim it. And God will give you whatever you desire. And you should see the following of this guy. You should see the thousands of people who flock to his church. You should see his TV ministry. You should see all the people who are buying his books. It's amazing. In fact, I can see how a preacher would be rather envious of that. 
you know, maybe I'm preaching the wrong material. What do you think? Maybe I ought to learn a lesson from some of these preachers. We could have an even bigger church, a more robust budget. We could just finally pay off this sanctuary. Maybe I ought to take a lesson and do that. It's really enticing. James and John thought so. In our scripture lesson for today, well, it was interesting. We see them wanting Jesus to give them whatever they want. And so they went up to Jesus. You know, Jesus was performing all these miracles and doing all these great things. And they said, this Jesus, he is our magic genie. So Jesus, we want you to give to us whatever we ask. And Jesus said, well, what is it you exactly want? And without batting an eye, they said, we want power and glory with you. We want to sit on your left hand, and we want to sit on your right hand. And Jesus said, well, if you want to do that, you got to be willing to do what I'm about to do. Now, can you imagine saying that to Jesus, what they said? Now, now understand, when Jesus said, what is it you want me to do for you? They didn't say, could you fix my lower back pain? Could you make me thinner? They didn't even say, I want you to solve world peace or end world hunger. Without batting an eye, they said, we want power and glory. Kind of bold, kind of selfish. But to be honest, Jesus did ask them for what they wanted, and they were honest. Let me ask you, how would you answer that question? What if as you were walking out of the parking lot today and Jesus confronted you and said, what is it you want me to do for you? What would be the first thing that would come to your mind? How would you answer that? That answer says a lot about who you are and where you are and what is most important to you. I recall in another church I served, I came across some interesting prayer requests. And as I was flipping through them, I noticed, you know, the typical ones were praying for our family and for loved ones and for loss and for healing. But there were some others that I thought were fascinating. One woman was praying that God would put into her boyfriend the desire to give her favorite diamond ring for Christmas. Hmm. Another person prayed, now this is in Florida, prayed that the Gators would win the upcoming game. I know none of you have ever prayed for your team to win. (laughs) Another prayed that God would make them better looking. Well, Lord, please. You know, it's interesting. I I don't know if you watched college football uh, yesterday. I'm sure none of you did. But um, I was watching it, and I noticed that the cameraman kind of panned to this lady in the stands and she was closing her eyes and she was clearly praying and then she did the sign of the cross. Oh, it was a holy moment. You know, you can tell a lot about a person by what they want from God, by what they ask of God. I knew a minister who was having an affair. Yeah, when they asked him if he felt guilty about it, you know what he said? He said, well, I've prayed to God about it, and God has not gotten rid of the temptation, so I really think God wants me to be happy. Well, when the church found out about it and his wife found out about it, um, they were not happy. And I've often wondered, did that minister really think that God wanted him to be happy if it meant his wife and his church was to be miserable? Jesus asked, what is it you want me to do for you? I recall going to a PGA tournament. I love watching those guys play. It's like they're from a different planet, the way they hit the golf ball. And we were following around a particular group of golfers, and we ran into the mother of one of the golfers playing on the PGA Tour. Oh, she was so proud. Nice lady. And we got to know her, and then there was a point in the middle of the round where she was closing her eyes, and she was praying. And so I was bold, and I I asked her, listen, I've got to ask you, what were you praying for? And she looked at me like I was a complete dummy, and she said, well, I'm praying for my son to win the tournament. 
What else? And then she said, don't you think God wants to give us the desires of our heart? Hmm. You know, sometimes I wonder whether all of our desires are really good things. If our desires are healthy. I don't think they are sometimes. And, it, and it's easy to forget this especially in our culture that's consumer-driven, that's designed to meet our every whim and fancy, and if it doesn't, we complain, and then we finally get what we want. And it's honestly easy to forget in the church, because for years in the church growth movement, the mantra has been, find a need and fill it. And for years as a minister, we have been trained through conferences and through workshops Find the felt needs in your community and then move heaven and earth to meet everyone's needs and everyone's desires and then you'll be successful and then your church will grow, grow, grow. I've even had people tell me this, rather honestly and rather boldly. Charlie, if you want to be a successful preacher, you have got to stop preaching challenging messages. That's not what people want. That's not what they want. Tell a couple of nice stories, then tell a joke and be on your way. That's the way to be a successful preacher. That's what people want. Maybe it is. Maybe it is what you want. Same person told me, Charlie, and when you do Bible studies, don't give them a lot of homework. People aren't going to read all that stuff. Do Bible studies on movies or sex or something. You know, don't make them think deeply. And Charlie, after all, for the sake of everything good, when you plan any Bible studies or ministries, look at the schedules of your people because there's other things in life. There are soccer games and there are vacations. And for the love of Almighty God, there is football after all. You know, it's interesting. Every fall in my ministry in the church, you know, we get excited as a clergy team and a staff because we know that everybody is coming back from their vacations. You know, kids will be back in school, and that means everybody will be back in church, and let's plan this and let's plan that. And inevitably, there is someone who ruins it by saying, uh, Charlie, don't forget, it's football season. And then we have to go on the internet and say, oh, that's right, we can't do it there because the Bulldogs are in town. Oh, we can't do it there. No, 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 because there's that game and no, we can't do it. No, 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 no. Now, the truth is, that's just the way things are, right? I mean, that's just reality. You got to accept that. That's where people are. Maybe they're right. Maybe that's what we really want. We want a church and a faith that just meets all of our desires and all of our needs. And we really can't grow a church unless we're as convenient as Walmart or Amazon. But I have a nagging question. I'm sorry, I've got to ask it. I have a nagging question as I prepared this message. You know, it... It woke me up at night. I wonder, I wonder sometimes if what we desire and what God desires for us doesn't match. What if what we think we need and what God thinks we need is not the same thing? What if the purpose of our faith is not to meet our every desire, but to change it. What if the purpose of our faith is not for us to be comfortable, but for us to be transformed? You think we can handle that? Are we ready for that? Are we prepared for that? I don't think James and John were prepared. Because when they asked Jesus, Jesus and said to Jesus, this is what we want 
you to do for us. We want glory. We want power. And Jesus said, listen, you don't know what you're asking. If you really want that, you're going to have to do what I'm about to do. You must be prepared to do what I'm about to do. And then the ten other disciples got mad because they thought James and John were trying to sneak behind them and be special. And they said, no, no, we want to be special too. Wait, 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 we want glory and we want power. And Jesus said, time out, time out. You have no clue what you're saying. You have no clue what you're asking. You see kingdoms of this world, and you see rulers lording it over people and getting whatever they want, and you said, I want that, but I'll tell you this. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, well, you're going to have to push aside your desires and be a servant. What? What did he say? Here's the reality. If you really want all your desires met and all your needs met, there are plenty of places to do it outside the church that do a much better job of that. I learned a long time ago that you can't please everybody in the church. I learned a long time ago that I was, I was going to be effective at this. I needed to learn that my job is to please God. Christian faith is not about satisfaction. The Christian faith is about transformation. And I'll warn you, and maybe this is a warning that needs to be said more often in churches and more often in sermons, I'll warn you. Unless you want your life turned upside down, unless you want to find out what it really feels like to push aside your desires and live by giving yourselves away, do not get close to Jesus Christ. Because he will turn your world upside down and he will show you what it really means to live. I've seen him do it. When I was teaching a preaching class, our classmates and students were getting to know each other and they were taking turns telling everybody who they were and where they served and what they did. And there was a distinguished looking man in the back who began to tell us that he used to make seven figures as an attorney. What? You're in my class? Yeah, God called him to preach, and he was now serving 40 people in a country church. You know, Jesus did that. Once knew a mean, crotchety man. Me most of his life. Then all of a sudden, Something changed, and he started an orphanage, of all things. Oh, and then I once met this guy who played minor league baseball. He was good. He was a catcher. Made it to the major leagues. And you know what happened? He made it to the major leagues, and you know what he did? Tarnation. He quit. Why in the world did you quit? said, well, there's got to be more to life than hitting and throwing a ball. Whew. I've told you before, I, in seminary, I served as a, a chaplain at Emory Hospital. Most of us who went to Candler did that. They, they called it supervised ministry. We called it supervised misery. It was tough. They said, oh, you want to be a pastor? Here you go. Put on a badge. Go see sick and dying people. You'll find out. Well, I had a supervisor who was rather unorthodox. He had a way of getting to the truth. And I was following him around one day. This is when I first started. I was green. It was, you know, I had a lot to learn. And we went to see a man who had drug issues, was in the hospital because of a drug overdose. He was a prominent man. Everybody knew who he was, and everybody found out about his drug problem. And we walked in, and the man started to cry and said, Chaplain, I've lost everything. I've lost my reputation. I have lost my livelihood. I have lost it all. 
And my supervisor said, I couldn't believe he said it. What? He said, oh, the end? Well, honestly, I see this as just the beginning. The man was floored. Didn't you hear what I said? I said, I've lost it all. He said, you've lost everything? Well, everything that ever mattered to me. And my supervisor replied, hmm. I guess that means God has you all to himself now, doesn't it? Imagine what God can do with you now. Let those who have ears to hear, hear. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, ground us again today in this holy place and remind us that the values of your kingdom don't always match the values of the world and that you call us to be transformed by your love, to show the world a better way. Oh Lord, we want to model that with all of our hearts. Give us the strength and the power to do it. It's in Christ's name we pray.